Haggai 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but you see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? Declared the Lord, declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew, and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. Thank you, church. My name is Lesejo, and I have the privilege of serving the body of Christ through Fellowship City, and this morning to open the word of God. This is a picture of a pool. You can see it in ruins now. The goal would have been to have that pool blue. The goal would have been to see many bodies swimming, community building, and a beautiful house feature. These pictures show steps towards the goal, the pool being built or rebuilt, and uh, maybe some opposition comes, like the cost of chemicals, adverse weather, winter, loss of time, maybe Virgin Active became the closest pool for swimming, or swimming was abandoned completely. Opposition stops the goal. There's another picture here of a car. In, in There's two states of this car. You, you will see the goal would have been to have a new car or a functioning car, one that can take one from point A to point B, to give others a lift and to be able to be mobile. At one time, the goal was insight. It was being built or refurbished or rebuilt, customized if you would like. Then opposition came, like money, no available parts, worker strike, and the list would continue. This is a picture of a gym system. The goal would have been to be fit, to lose weight. The one on the top left is a relic of the Tula home. Well, the bottom, that uh, wheelie, is a relic of the Tula home. So if you walk in, you might uh, bump into that chap. At one time, any of these would have been a weapon of choice to achieve the goal which is to lose weight, to get in shape, summer goals, and a wedding season. Then opposition comes, like new projects at work, adjusting family routine, new season of the blacklist or the Kardashians, 
or maybe even Bursuka Fro. So opposition comes and destabilizes the goal. This is a picture of a patio. I do promise that this one on the left is a patio. It was coming. Um, it doesn't look so much like a patio, but it, was, it is a patio. Uh, the goal would have been to host people, to socialize, and opposition comes, like neighbor complaints about noise or an obstructed view, or story, or st story after story from the builders, um, increasing budget, and maybe building a pool or a cow starting to gym becomes more important, or the flavor of the moment because the goal is not realized. So the common theme you should hear as we talk through these pictures is commitment to a goal, commitment to do something believing in it, but facing opposition or being distracted from the commitment that was previously there, commitment that was previously lit. The opposition or distractions are all relevant and important, but they will overshadow the commitment that existed before. So they're relevant and important, maybe the distractions that might come, but they will overshadow that goal or that previous commitment. At times, being reminded about the previous commitment, maybe by your wife, who is not nagging, um, or sometimes by a husband who is not controlling, or a friend who is not being nosy, would be enough to possibly shift one back onto sight of that goal, back into commitment, back into work, back on track. So we start a new series today in the book of Haggai. We will see the people of God who are in covenant with God doing the work of God because of the covenant with God. Their goal is to rebuild the temple of God, which was destroyed. The temple of God would then be the place people come to encounter God. We will see distractions that change priorities to other good priorities, but we will see Haggai speak from God and the people respond and continue the work of God. This should stir us to remember the good news of the gospel. It should stir us to check our priorities. Where we stray, there is grace. And being, it should stir us to be encouraged to continue to build the kingdom of God to the praise of the name of God. Let's pray and ask God by His Spirit to help us understand His Word and to be changed by it. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for uh, just an opportunity this morning to come together, to fellowship, to sing songs of praise and worship to You, to be reminded of Your great love and who You are as we sing together. We're thankful that we're able to gather and sit this way, sit under Your Word and, and hear Your Word. I pray that you would remove any distractions, either things from this past week or the week to come, or things that are around us, phones vibrating, and the lunch that is still to come. Please remove all these distractions from us so that we can hear you through your Holy Spirit speak to us. Would you speak through my vocal cords so that your people may hear your word? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Four points this morning as we look at Haggai chapter 1. So we'll, we'll look at some context. I think it's always good to understand the context. We are a gospel-centered uh, church, so it is important to understand what is happening here uh, before we start to look at the implications. So the first one will be the context. Then the second point will be seeking self first is folly. So seeking self first is folly and no fulfillment outside of wrong priorities. That's the third point. And then we'll see the response from the correction. So somewhat hidden towards the end of the Old Testament, you will find the book of Haggai. It is a short book, so if you're going to flip through the pages aggressively, you may miss it. Haggai is stirred from the bottom, which is surrounded by all the other minor prophets, just before you hit that New Testament. The book of Haggai is a two-chapter book. However, they're shorter books of the Bible, like, uh, chap like the one chapter of Obadiah or uh, Philemon and Jude, which are in the New Testament. So it is a short book, but there are other short books. We will hear or see the prophetic words of Haggai through this book that can, that can propel and inspire us as we start this new year and posture us to build the kingdom of God. I mentioned prophets earlier. The prophets in the Old Testament mostly 
accused or spoke to the people of God or the people of Israel about breaking the covenant of God through idolatry, uh, meaning the worship of other gods or injustice, which you would find in, in books like 2 Kings 24 and 25. So the prophets would warn that God would send Babylon, who would bring about destruction of Jerusalem and the temple of God, and the Israelites would be in exile. So exile meaning being removed or rather expelled from a land that is yours by birthright. In 1587 BC, the destruction of Jerusalem happens. The Israelites were expelled and taken captive as prophesied by the prophets. The prophets through, though have hope in their prophecy that one day God would bring about a new Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. So the book of Haggai happens around 520 BC, which is close to 70 years after the destruction. So there's a destruction of Jerusalem, of the temple, Then 70 years later we find the book of Haggai speaking back to the people of God. At this point in the timeline, the Babylonian Empire has collapsed, so those that went to destroy the temple um, are no longer the powers of the day, but there's the Persians who are now occupying that, that namespace. They are the, the superpower in that time. They allow the Israelites to return to Jerusalem, which was destroyed, so that they would build them. They are led by Joshua, who is the high priest of Zerubbabel, who is from the lineage of David, and Haggai, probably um, Zechariah as well. So, the, they, so the, um, Zerubbabel and Josh, Joshua and Haggai are part of the people that leave from Babylon to go towards building this new temple. The Israelites have gone back to rebuild the temple. And we see this reference in Ezra chapters 5, 1, verses 1 to 2. It reads as follows. Now Haggai the prophet and Zechariah the prophet, a descendant of Edo, prophesied to the Jews in Judah and Jerusalem in the name of the God of Israel who was over them. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, son of Josedek, set to work to rebuild the house of God in Jerusalem, and the prophets of God were with them, supporting them. There's this other scripture showing that this group of people went to go rebuild this temple of God. So the book of Haggai starts from this point. It is short, but it can also be further broken into four messages that Haggai brings as a message from God, as a messenger from God. So chapter one as a whole is one message. That is what we're gonna focus on this morning. Um, then roughly one month later from this, this message, from chapter one, we get the second message, which will be preached next week. Reno will share that message as he focuses on chapter two, verse one to nine. That's the second message, which addresses uh, which, which Haggai uses to encourage um, the discouraged as they're building this temple. So why were they discouraged? You'll have to come next week to find out as Reno expresses that. So I encourage you to come next week. Roughly two months from the second message, we get the third message, where Haggai would have instilled some hope for the Israelites to continue building the temple. And Haggai shares the third message shortly after as well. So we will have three sermons in this mini-series which should address faithfulness to the call to build the kingdom of God. Haggai calls the people to be faithful so that they can see the kingdom of God built and they can see the blessing of God. So Haggai chapter 1 verse 1 says, In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains a ruin? So remember that the Persian Empire released the Israelites. Some went to build the temple and rebuild Jerusalem. So the people released included Zerubbabel, Haggai, and Joshua. And these are the people who would, who, who would say God is first and prioritize God in their lives. 
They would speak about obedience to God. They are the first to go back to rebuild Jerusalem and to build the temple of God. The temple of God in Jerusalem was a place where people would come to encounter God, where people would come to recommit to God, turn back from sin. The temple of God would build the kingdom of God as people encounter God and turn to God. The book of Haggai and the messages of Haggai start around 20 years later. When there is still a foundation to the temple, there's a foundation that they started, but not much else. So the prophet speaks as God leads. Haggai questions the priorities of the people. The people are not building the house of the Lord as they were supposed to. However, instead, they're building their own houses. They have drifted from their belief of the supremacy of God, and they are now distracted by other priorities from God. Why have they stopped? That's a great question. Ezra chapter 4 explains why they've stopped. So we will paraphrase it a little bit just to show why they've stopped. So when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, let us help you build. But, Jer- but Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the families of Israel answered, you have no part with us in building a temple to our God. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and to make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and to frustrate their plans. The opposition continues in chapter 4, if you were to read it, of Ezra. The enemies then send a letter to the king about the rebuilding of the temple, who then orders that work to stop. So there is real opposition to the building of the temple. Then people start farming, people start building nice houses, building families, and maybe even getting used to life without the temple. This is what we see in verses 6. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Haggai was speaking to Christians who had committed to building the temple of God, who had left homes in Babylon because of the commitment of rebuilding the temple. So they reprioritized their lives because of the distractions or the opposition that they faced. They started with good intentions, but soon lost the vision of God. They lost track. They got distracted. Not necessarily by bad things, as we saw some of the distractions. This would very much be like Christians today. When we think of the temple of God today, we should know that we are the temple of God. The temple of God in the Old Testament was a place where people would go to encounter God, to bring offering and sacrifice of sin. It was a place where people could seek and find God. Jesus comes and destroys the temple and rebuilds it in three days. Jesus Christ does so because there's a separation between people and God because of sin. That sin needs to be paid for. When Jesus Christ returns and judges the world. Jesus, however, dies on the cross for you and me so that we don't have to face punishment for our sins. When this happens, we have the guarantee of our salvation, which is the Holy Spirit that comes and dwells within us. So now our relationship with God is redeemed, it is restored, we have access to God directly. We have the Holy Spirit dwell in us. We should be the lens in which people meet and encounter God as the temple of God. So rebuilding the temple of God in this day and age is building the kingdom of God because we are the temple of God. So building the temple of God today would be like buying a Bible or a devotional, joining a Bible study or a church, serving in the church, teaching the children of the church, doing missions in different neighborhoods or countries, studying theology, then facing opposition like clashing with another Christian about how to do things, about culture, about a sinkhole making your route to church harder, not seeing results in your effort in serving, finances being a reason why you're not able to commit anymore, not being able to contribute anything. Keeping fit might be a, one of those, and attending gym or broken down vehicle, a new baby or leaking roof or facing COVID, which pauses the work which was happening. So these can all be... A, distractions or position to building the temple of God. So you pause 
and start to adjust your career. You get married, you have a baby, build, buying a new house and a growing set of bills, start playing sport on a Sunday or boat riding, start reducing how often you are at church or meeting with God's people. The church and the work of God becomes like that last debit order that can bounce because there isn't enough money rather than being the first debit order when the account is full. So Haggai 1 verse 2 says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. You tell yourself that it's not time to commit to building the kingdom of God. That brother or that sister or that pastor is still there. The roof is still leaking. You need to install solar. ESCOM is still load shedding. It's not a new baby, but it's the brother or the sister. Maybe even a new variant of COVID. Maybe a new level that you can reach or achieve at work. Maybe it's no longer a boat that you're riding, but a jet ski. So I'm not saying don't live life, and I don't think that's what Haggai is saying here. I need to tread carefully here. What I'm not saying is that people should not have families, pursue careers, have material things, and enjoy life and recreational activities. This is also not what Haggai is saying here. So quick side road. Verse 4 says they lived in paneled houses. The context of this is that these were nice houses, maybe even big houses, because panels were only used in building temples and royal houses. We see this in 1 Kings verse 6 and 2 Kings 7. So Haggai isn't saying they should not live in nice houses. Haggai isn't saying they should, Haggai is saying they should place God's will above their own will. He is saying they need to first prioritize the things of God before their own. The Israelites were no longer building the temple of God, but building their lives or their wealth or their own priorities. So there's nothing wrong with living in a nice house or pursuing a career or building family or recreational activities. What is wrong is forgetting about what is, the most, what is of most importance which is Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Like Marita prayed, our desire should be to learn from God and to praise God. Our desire should be that God is glorified. That should be of first importance. So our second point. No fulfillment outside of God. So in verse 6, you'll see it says, you have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty? Because of my house, which remains a ruin, which each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, the olive oil and everything else the ground produces, on people and livestock and on, on all the labor of your hands. So the Israelites' priorities distracted them from seeking God first. They chased after the wrong things. They made excuses not to pursue the things of God. We see that this is also counterproductive. We see that this is also counterproductive. Priorities outside of God first don't fulfill. They don't satisfy they don't return on investment. The drought on the labor of their hands means however hard they work, they don't see the results. There is no satisfaction. They invest in the ground, but it doesn't produce what they expect. There are a lot of good things that distract us in this day and age. If we are doing them void of prioritizing the things of God, if we are pursuing a career, growing family, building generational wealth, that side hustle, if we're saving money, going to the gym, but not prioritizing the things of God, we may not see fruit. We may not see progress. 
We may be surprised that things aren't working out because there is a drought on your hands and on the land. The response, the third point. So verse 12 says, Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him, and the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message to the Lord, of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. And on the 24th day, on the 24th day of the sixth month, the people hear the prophet. They refocus their priorities on building the house of the Lord. They put Christ first where Christ belongs. They seek first the kingdom of God. Last week, we, re- we reaffirmed why we're here in 2023, that God loves us, that Jesus Christ died to break the dividing wall of hostility between us and God. And because of the blood of Jesus on the cross, we are redeemed. We are holy, we are blameless, and we are adopted children of God. And this is enough to praise God. This is what our lives should be, a praise unto God. And this week we see that we should build the kingdom of God first. Verses 13, God is with his people. That's what he says, as they are building the house of the Lord. As we close, I understand that we enter different seasons of life. Sometimes life is hard. Maybe there is short-term or long-term sickness in the family. Maybe there's fatigue. Maybe there's tiredness. Maybe being worn out or burnt out. There is grace. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. That is what God says in 2 Corinthians. So rest is important. Healing is important. We don't have to pretend with one another and with God. He understands. So there is grace. Sometimes there are periods when it is busy, end of financial year at work, traveling season, training new people, audits. There is grace. Sometimes there's trouble at home, work needs to be done, costs money, costs time, roof is leaking, and the boundary wall collapses. There is grace. Sometimes it's exam season, you have to study and complete the PhD or master's, you have to start the degree or short course. Or you have to start that business and start providing for yourself or your family. There is grace. What we're not saying, or what Haggai is not saying, is that life has to continue. There are things that we have to do. We have to take care of our families. We have to work. What he is saying is that we need to prioritize building the kingdom of God. As a church, we believe in the fivefold ministry, which means we believe that God uniquely gifts uh, people in the church. Some to be apostles, small letter A, meaning those who did not see and walk with, physically with Jesus Christ, but are gifted to build networks and structures. That's what an apostle would be. That is how we see an apostle. So God would, apo- would give some to build networks and structures. God would give prophets who would help the people of God to refocus on God who are concerned about holiness, who are concerned about faithfulness to the covenant of God. Some would be evangelists, those who are wired to seek out those who don't know God, who can hold and initiate conversations and bring those who are outside inside. Some are shepherds, concerned about spiritual maturity and concerned about people. And some are teachers, they teach the word of God. We have a couple of prophets in the church and I've been fortunate enough to speak to two of them and they did not speak together, but the sentiment and the words I got from them is that in starting the year, we need to focus on God. We need to focus on praising God in everything that we do. This is from last week. Another said that after last week's message, how are we building the kingdom of God? How are we affecting the community? How is the gospel growing the church? They said we need to focus on building the church. And this is outside of us having previously thought to preach the series. 
but that's just affirmation as well that people that are gifted in this church are saying how are we focused on building the kingdom of god as individuals and as the church so the first teaching of the year was geared around posturing us for what is true and important because of the blood of jesus christ which redeems us and adopts us in, into christ we ought to praise god in everything Let me share some vision for the year with you. These are priorities of Fellowship City. This is how we believe that we would affect the community and build the kingdom of God. Our biggest priority for the year hangs around discipleship, which means teaching the gospel to the hearts of our people so there's real change in the individual, in the marriage, in the community, and in communities. We do say we are a gospel-centered, disciple-making and transcultural church after all. So we have a course that is coming that is named Deeper, which will reaffirm the gospel, but drive us to a deeper relationship with God as we grow in our knowledge of God. This is both individual and corporate community gospel renewal. We will have a marriage course like we, we had one last year, but this year we have started implementing a couple of changes to the content and structure geared to helping the marriages of our church, the marriages of, of the community around us to flourish. We will have foundations, a course that helps new believers grow, or believers who just want to go back to the basics of the faith to grow in their knowledge of God. That's part of how discipleship, that's part of how we see discipleship. We will have an outreach week. This is new for the church. We believe God has us in this community for a reason to bring good news to the community and to serve the community. So we will find ways in which to do this in that week through different teams. Different teams would go out into the community in respect of trying to reach the community and bring the good news to the community. We will have worship, a worship evening and carols in, the, in this year as well. These are great events to invite a friend to church. We will have a couple of lechotlas, which directly translated in English means court, but the right sense of the word is conversation. So we will have conversations about things that are affecting our community, affecting our country, and affecting our people, and we'll bring the gospel to these issues. Also a great opportunity to invite people. We believe the gospel speaks to all of life. We will have kids' spaces, an opportunity to invite kids from the community to come on a Friday afternoon. We will have something for the kids, like singing or other initiatives. We will also invite the parents of the kids to come and have tea or get a voice role. This is our opportunity to meet families in our community, to connect with kids and parents, and to bring the gospel, the gospel to our community. This is just to mention a few initiatives that we have as a church to build the kingdom of God both in the church and out of the church, meaning the community that God has placed us in. These should bring excitement. We need to pray. We need to lean on God to lead and guide us. We do this because to worship Jesus is our sole desire, because he has shaped our hearts for his pleasure, because of the Lamb of God who sits on the throne, Jesus Christ who died on the cross for you and my sins, so that we would have life, so that we would lift his name on high, that we would affirm that Jesus Christ is Lord and he is holy. The Israelites' response to God, they got back to the goal of building the temple of God because of the covenant that they have with God. We too share in this covenant because of what Jesus Christ has done on the cross. So we too should check our priorities and build the temple of God and build the kingdom of God. The questions I would ask you this morning is, what can you do this year to build the kingdom of God and to build your joy in God? Have you told anyone about it to hold you accountable? Our joy in God primarily comes through a relationship with God and the grace that he gives us in order to continue building that relationship. We will be blessed when we spend time with God, when we read the Bible, when we pray, when we meet with the people of God through church, through Bible study, through other initiatives, we will be blessed. That is how we build the temple of God, building our relationship with him and being more like Christ. I shared last week uh, 
part of being blessed in a relationship with God is the impact of reading the Bible. Dopamine, which is a chemical in the brain that makes you feel good. So dopamine is released and makes us more motivated, more focused and happy. This is from a study conducted last year. That's the effects of reading the Bible. So what can you do this year to build the temple of God and to increase your joy in God? And have you told someone about it to hold you accountable? Second question, are you building the kingdom of God and what's that one initiative you are joining or starting this year to build the temple and the kingdom of God? We ought to be light where God has placed us. We should, we should be sharing the good news, proclaiming Christ crucified for sins. It is how we live, the decisions we make, the priorities we have. Are there ways which God has placed in your heart to build his kingdom? To invite people to church, to serve in church, to look for initiatives like the Kids Community Outreach Week. Like I heard two other sisters in church speaking about Eat and Run. Are you building the kingdom of God and what's that one initiative you are joining or starting this year? to build the kingdom of God. What is that one miracle you are praying for? This could be someone's salvation in your family or work that God would soften their heart. This could be an initiative that would bless or build a group of people in your area that I need physically, emotionally, or spiritually. This could be something that would address redemption to a group of people or mercy and justice that could build a community around you. There's so much more that maybe God has placed and is stirring in your heart. What is that one miracle you are praying for? What is that one thing taking up most of your time that you can redeem? TV, reading news, or social media, recreational activities, all these things are good, but it depends on how often you're practicing in them, what they take away from your time to prioritize. Maybe you need to review your priorities. What could you do to build up your church? The church is not a building, but people of God who are gathering together, a community of people. These people should be focused on praising God, building other people, or bringing other people into the community. Yes, we should also be kingdom-minded about how we individually build the church, but there's also a corporate building of the church as well. You will notice I said build up your church where God has placed you, where you frequent, where you call home. It may not be Fellowship City, but what could you do to build up your church? The Holy Spirit may be speaking to you now, laying things on your heart. How could you build your relationship with God, being purposeful in community, discipleship, one-on-one, removing distractions, I want to encourage you to speak to someone. Let someone know and hold you accountable to the work of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit is doing. The Holy Spirit may be awakening an initiative that would build and activate the kingdom of God. Don't ignore it. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to speak to someone. I encourage you to pray, to ask the Holy Spirit to lead and guide you. You may feel encouraged. Maybe a fire is lit. Nurture that fire. Share that story with someone so that they would hold you accountable encourage you and walk with you. Let's build the temple of God. Let's build the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that um, as we sung that your power is within us through your Holy Spirit. As we sung, your kingdom is within us. We pray that you would help us that through your spirit that individually and corporately you would put a focus or help us to reprioritize where we need to reprioritize. That our lives would be of praise unto God. That our lives would be of building the kingdom of God. I pray for those that are sitting here this morning or listening on YouTube or on audio podcast, if if the Holy Spirit is stirring up something in their hearts, I pray that that would be nurtured, that they would nurture it, that they would walk alongside other brothers and sisters to help nurture that fire, to help nurture the work of the Holy Spirit. 
thank you that we do not have to build your kingdom alone, and that we partner with you, that the Holy Spirit helps us to partner with you, to build the kingdom of God. It is your kingdom that we're building. And we thank you that as we partner, we can walk together, we can share in this journey, and the work of our hands can be blessed as we praise and worship you, as we build the kingdom of God. I pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen.